So welcome everyone. Happy Native Plant Appreciation Month and happy Earth Day. And hope you're all getting out and enjoying the abundance of plants, even through this wild and wacky weather. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and just get right to it. Okay. So welcome to our introduction to plant families. I'm super glad you're all here. My name is Gina Bono. I'm a volunteer here with the Native Plant Society of Oregon. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about plant families. So if that is what you signed up for, you're in the right place. Let's see. Okay, um, just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, if you could stay muted throughout the program, that's helpful. Um, I can't see the chat while I'm in presenter mode as just kind of the uh, nature of this program for me. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and um, we can keep it informal. And uh, if you don't feel like unmuting yourself, you can always type it in the chat. Just know that I won't be able to see those questions until the very end. Um, I'm uh, anticipating this lasting a little bit longer than 60 minutes and I did a run through. Um, my goal was 60 minutes, but I definitely went over. So um, if you got to run, that's fine. We are recording this um, if you want to come back and watch the end later. But um, my goal is 60 minutes, so we'll see how we do. Um, and how this is kind of uh, structured is we're going to talk about what a plant family is, a little bit of the uh, basic biology classification system that family is a part of, and then go over nine of our common uh, Pacific Northwest families that um, you might encounter if you're going out in the field um, and some of their like key identifying traits. So how to um, associate a plant with a certain family. Okay. Uh, before we dive in, I'd just like to do a quick uh, land acknowledgement. I'm here in Multnomah County as I assume many of our uh, Portland chapter members are as well. So to recognize the indigenous people of this area, um, I'll just say Multnomah County rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, and Kalapuya, Malala, and um, many other tribes who have uh, made their homes along the Columbia River. And it's uh, particularly uh, it timely or important to um, bring in a land acknowledgement as we're talking about native plants who uh, which you know um, are directly associated with the native people who cultivated and uh, were the stewards of this land for thousands of years and we are going to dive into the biological classification system and the naming system and all of that and um, if you've been around botany for a while you can recognize that a lot of our plant names are named after uh, European explorers and uh, colonists and very much of that era. Um, but just know that, or I'd like to recognize that that's just one way of knowing. And um, there's a whole lineage of history associated with these plants that we're gonna talk about um, that's been forcibly erased. So um, if you are in a different area and you're curious about the tribes um, of that area, you can go to this website, native-land.ca, and um, you can type in any address and find out um, who the tribes are in that area. It's a great website if you haven't um, explored that for yourself. Okay. So with that, we're gonna just get into what is a plant family. So you can think about a plant family kind of like, um, you know, your family tree. So we're looking at common ancestors. Um, we're looking at how these um, relationships formed along the way and um, kind of how these um, different um, species are related to one another. So uh, just a very general way to think about it is to think about your own family lineage and kind of how those pieces fit together. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here with these plant organisms, a little more tricky, as you can imagine. 
Um, they didn't write it down. So uh, a lot of investigative work, but um, that's kind of a, a little image that you can think about when you're thinking about a plant family. So the way that uh, we uh, group organisms in the biological classification system is based on this hierarchy. So working at the broadest sense with all of the life on earth um, and, and kind of siphoning out different groups based on various characteristics um, and separating those groups out further and further refining them and then getting down to the species level. And so this uh, genus and species is the, um, the lowest level of uh, recognition in order to um, identify like one specific organism. Of course, things actually are more complicated than that. You can get varieties and subspecies within uh, a species, but that's kind of the, um, the goal is to get down to a single organism. And um, when we talk about a species, kind of a working definition of what a species is, is um, a group of organisms that can reproduce naturally with one another and create fertile offspring. Um, this isn't always the case. Obviously, life is complicated and um, things can outcross and uh, do weird stuff when you get down to um, this, this level. And uh, so, but you know, it's, it's the best we have in, in order to kind of delineate what that, what that means when we talk about a species. So we're gonna kind of run through these classification systems. So starting at the top, uh, this is often called the kingdom. I like to just take the G out and call it the kingdom since uh, organisms are more kin than kings. So looking at all of life on earth, um, we're gonna separate out into very broad groups. So starting at the top um, and where we're going this evening is, so we're not gonna talk about animals. We're not gonna talk about fungi, protozoa, et cetera. Those are in their own kingdom. And we're gonna be focusing on the uh, kingdom plantae. So these are organisms that um, are photosynthetic usually. Um, they have chlorophyll, which is what gives them the ability to photosynthesize um, and, and create their own food. They also have cell walls, um, which is uh, more of a microscopic characteristic. Um, that's pretty cool if you ever get the chance to look at it under a microscope. So from that very broad kingdom, uh, we go, get to the phylum or division. These names are used interchangeably. interchangeably. Um, and so we're siphoning out uh, part of the plant kingdom. And tonight we're gonna be talking specifically about the seed plants or um, the technical name is angiosperms. So that means we won't be talking about non-vascular plants. So your mosses, your liverworts, um, vascular, referring to the um, vascular system that moves water and nutrients through the structure of a plant. So mosses and um, liverworts and things simply absorb the water through their cells. Um, so we're gonna uh, siphon those out. <laughs> and then we're not gonna be talking about ferns and allies. So things like horsetails and um, club mosses. Uh, those are, they're also plants. We're, we're still in the plant kingdom. Um, but they reproduce uh, via spores. So um, kind of like a mushroom has spores. Um, so that's a whole nother world um, in this plant region. And then we're also gonna leave the conifers to the side this evening as well. So um, plants that reproduce with cones, you know, our dug fir, our cedar, uh, true firs, things like that. So we're specifically going to focus on the angiosperms. So, um, these are defined as plants that have a seed enclosed in a fruit. So from there, here we are in the angiosperms, we're further refining. Um, and now we get to class. And this is um, something that will help us in the field if we're trying to um, understand what family a uh, certain plant is that we're encountering. So this is a great distinction to get a good um, visual search image for. If, is it a monocot or is it a dicot? So what that means is when the seedling first emerges as um, from a seed, uh, it'll shoot up either one cotyledon or two cotyledons. So these are not true leaves, they're called seed leaves. And if you've ever grown um, some vegetables, for instance, by seed, 
you'll recognize like an onion shoots up one seedling, whereas um, something like a radish is gonna have two seedlings. So monocot, mono one, one seedling, dicot, die two, two seedlings. Um, obviously if we're out in the field and we're encountering a new uh, plant, we're not going to be identifying the seedling. We're gonna have a full grown plant. So these uh, cotyledons are gonna be far gone. So there's other characteristics that we can uh, cue in on to let us know if it's a monocot or a dicot. So for monocots, we wanna look for uh, parallel leaf veination. So you'll notice that picture um, on the left of that leaf and you can see the little ridges. Those are the veins of the leaf. And you can notice that those veins never intersect each other. So they are parallel. That's one distinction. Um, and to contrast, you can look at the uh, leaf on the left of the dicotyledon and uh, notice that there's a, a strong mid vein in the middle and then multiple veins coming out of that and possibly more veins um, shooting off from those secondary veins as well. So uh, those veins intersect and that is a easy um, characteristic that we can see uh, quite readily out in the field. Um, the other thing that we can uh, notice is if we have the flower of our plant that we're trying to identify and we talk about plant parts. So um, this is basically the reproductive uh, structure of the flower. So we're looking at the petals and the sepals and the male and female reproductive structures. And for instance, if you see a flower that has parts in threes, um, that means you may have six petals, six stamens, um, things like that. So multiples of threes. Um, whereas if you are looking at a dicot, you will find things in multiples of twos or fours, fivers or tens, um, that kind of thing. So um, those are kind of the, the helpful things that we can cue in on when we're um, looking at a new plant out in the field and, and kind of recognizing, is it a monocot or is it, is it a dicot? The vast majority of the plants that we're going to find out in the field are going to be dicots. So when you find a monocot, it's like, oh, you know, that, that really narrows it down quite quickly. So um, that's helpful. Okay, so that was class. Uh, we're going to kind of skip over order. It's, uh, it's just a further refining process. Um, there's a lot of different order. They all end in Ailes um, and just further uh, separating out different uh, key characteristics. And we're just going to skip right to family. So here we are. Um, this is kind of where we're going this evening. Um, and these are the nine families that I'm uh, going to cover. So um, I won't list them all, we'll, we'll get there. But essentially the um, naming convention for families is that all families are gonna end in this suffix A-C-E. Um, some of the families that we're gonna go over have old family names. And so they had to be changed in order to um, adhere to these new naming conventions. Um, and they're also named after a type genus. So this would be a genus that is uh, selected because it represents the most characteristic traits of that family. Um, so once we're in a family, um, then we can get to genus and species. Um, so there's multiple genera in within um, each family. And uh, from there, you can hone in on individual species. And then, like I said, sometimes it goes even further into subspecies and varieties. And um, just know that that's also a possibility. Um, so this genus and species is essentially how we identify one organism, not just plants, but all um, organisms have a, a Latin binomial, it's called. We use a binomial nomenclature system, which was developed by a uh, Swedish botanist, Carlo, Lin Carlo Linnaeus, um, in like the 1600s. So we're still using this today. Um, so these names are Latinized. They're typically seen uh, written in italics. And um, so the genus and species, you know, there's only one genus and species specific to an organism. So it really aims to uh, clarify any confusion with uh, common or regional names. Um, I really like common names and regional names. I think they're, 
useful, um, but we just have to recognize that they're only useful when we are in a specific area. For instance, uh, the skunk cabbage that we might know here in the um, Pacific Northwest on the west side of the Cascades is different than what some people might call skunk cabbage on the east side of the Cascades. So even within this small narrow region, um, there can be a lot of differences um, around common names and it can get quite confusing. So um, if you really want to communicate something clearly to, to somebody else, um, using the genus and species is the best tool that we have at this point. Okay. So that got us down to the biological classification. And now we're gonna do a quick review um, of the parts of a flower. So when we're looking at plants, we're wanting to know what family it's in. Um, we really need to start counting and looking at more closely the, the different parts of a flower. So if you've never seen this kind of diagram, it's kind of a generic flower picture. And um, so you could imagine uh, a flower that's in bud and starting at the very outer part of that flower bud are the, the green leaf-like kind of structures that enclose the bud before it opens. So we're gonna start with that outer whorl and that's called the sepals. And uh, essentially that's what its um, job is to protect the, the bud of the flower. Um, collectively, you might see the word uh, calyx and that refers to the sepals as well when you're talking about the, the whole collection of sepals of multiple individual sepals. Um, inside of that whorl, then we get to the petals. So this is you know, the showy part of a flower that you might see um, most uh, readily um, and often showy, uh, colorful, uh, really designed to attract pollinators. Um, and this, the collective term for this whorl is the corolla. So you might see that term thrown on, around as well. Okay, so we're moving in, inward um, from there. And now we're at the um, male reproductive structure. And this is made up of stamens. So the stamens are uh, the name of the, the male reproduct reproductive structure, which include one long stalk and then a little like ball-like thing on the top of that stalk we call the anther, which contains the pollen, which of course pollinates um, the female part so that uh, uh, the next generation um, can be created. So inside of the, the, uh, the kind of collective term for stamens is the andresium, but inside of that whorl, we get to the female part. So the um, pistil, it's often called, or the carpal. And this includes, uh, you can see there in the, in the bottom, half of the carpal, the ovary, which contains the ovules, um, which of course will grow into the seed once they've been pollinated. And then above that, we've got the, the style, and, which is like the stalk. And then on top of that, we have this little stigma. And oftentimes the stigma is like a sticky kind of substance. And that is what um, the pollen grains will land on and actually grow a little pollen tube down the style and fertilize the ovaries or the ovules to create the seed or the next generation. So when we're um, trying to identify plants, it's important to um, look at these different structures, notice the patterns of how they are formed within the flower. And with that, we can kind of um, start to hone in on different family characteristics. We, we often are counting. So we're counting the, the sepals, we're counting the petals, we're counting the stamens, we're, um, we're looking if they are fused together, we're looking if they're um, separated, we're looking at whether they have um, bilateral or radial symmetry, Bi bilateral symmetry meaning if it's like a face where it's cut down the middle only uh, one way, uh, will that be a mirror image? Um, whereas radial symmetry, um, you could imagine you could cut that flower in any um, place and you fold it over and it'll be a mirror image on both sides. Okay, so 
that's a little bit of background. And um, we're just going to dive in to our first family from here. So the first family I'm going to talk about is the breast case. So this is commonly called the mustard family. Um, this is one of those families that does have an old name. So the old name for this is the cruciferae. And that's actually helpful because um, if we look at the picture of the flower, we'll notice that there are four petals. Like I said, we're going to be counting petals and sepals and things like that. So um, four petals in this family. And we can think of that like a cross. So cruciferae, crucifix named for that cross-like pattern of the petals. Um, this was also renamed because it didn't, it was not named for the type genus. So the type genus of this family is Brassica. Um, Brassica rapa is on that, um, this slide here, which is um, an ancestral plant for a lot of our um, Brassica crops. So I think like radishes and turnips and things like that come from Brassica rapa. Um, there's another Brassica, Brassica um, oleracee, which is the ancestral plant for um, like cabbage and kale and things like that, I believe. So if you're a gardener, you're quite familiar with these flowers, with this family, with the brassicas in general, even if you eat vegetables, um, you might have an idea of, of what the brassicas are. So this is a dicot. The flowering parts are in fours. Um, so we know it's not in threes, which would make it a monocot. The first uh, seven families we're going to go over are going to be dicots. Um, so like I said, the flowers have four sepals, four petals, six stamens, and they have radial symmetry. So again, if you cut that flower in any way, it's going to create a mirror image on both sides. Um, and then flowers perfect. That just means that both the male and female um, parts are present. Um, the leaves are simple to compound, mostly alternate. That's not very diagnostic for us. That's, that could be a lot of things at this point. Um, the fruit is actually quite diagnostic in this family. So, um, this is the only family that's going to have a silical or a silic. And, um, so that's super helpful if we have a plant that is in fruit and, um, we don't have flowers, but we're still trying to identify it. Um, the fruit is actually quite uh, helpful in this family. So the really important thing to recognize in the mustard family is that, so you've got your four petals and then you've got six stamens. And this pattern is um, really key, really diagnostic to this family, because um, if you see this cross section of this picture here, um, you can see that two of those stamens are, are in the middle and they're uh, taller than the other two stamens on the outside. Um, so this picture is not showing all of the stamens. So two of those taller stamens are actually missing from this image, but um, that's a really key characteristic for this family and not one that's shared with an, another family. So this is something um, that we really wanna hone in on if we're uh, thinking it's a mustard. If we see those four petals, we can open up that flower very carefully and notice the stamens um, and noticing that that two of those stamens are going to be shorter than the four in the center. And um, this is really clear, really helpful. Uh, well, I guess if, if you have a, a large enough flower, there's a lot of small flowers in this family. So hand lenses are really helpful um, for seeing those stamens. So, um, but once you see it, then, then you're like, oh yeah, that's a mustard. And then, like I said, the fruits are characteristic of this family as well. So they are considered a modified capsule. There's a lot of capsules out there, um, but uh, they come in two types. So we've got a silique, which I like to think of as sleek, so longer than wide, and a silicone, so wider than long, or just kind of wider in general. Not Maybe not completely wider than long, but fatter. Um, so you'll see the picture on the very left of that silique, and you can see the two valves of the fruit and how they've separated out and then the seeds in the middle are actually attached by that membrane and then you can see a, a cross section of the fruit in the middle there of the uh, silicone and how the the seeds are attached to the um the whole way around of the wall 
So that's really helpful when we're looking at the mustard family. And then here's uh, some images of um, some of the diversity of our Pacific Northwest native um, mustard family plants. So things you might encounter out there. This is kind of to give you a, a general search image for what you're looking for um, when you're out in the field looking at plants and maybe thinking it's a mustard. Um, I had to put this Linaria annua in there. That's the money plant, it has really cool fruits. Um, so th that would be a silica. I still have to think about it, a silica. Um, so wider than long. Um, like I said, some of these fruits are quite di diagnostic. Below that, we've got um, one of our cardamines. We have a lot of different um, cardamine species in the region. So um, more of a, a, a dissected leaf and the classic for four petals right there. Um, in the middle, we've got the rock crest, the arabis. So you can see those long sleeks underneath the kind of generic looking white flowers. And then the lipidium below that has the um, silicol, so the more rounded fruits attached to those. Um, the wallflower, um, kind of a classic yellow looking um, mustard family plant. And then um, I really like those lace pod, the thysanocarpus. Some of these fruits are really cool in this family. Um, so that one is actually a quite small plant. So you, you, um, you might overlook it <laughs> at some point, but um, when you get down into it and, and look at it closely, those fruits are quite intricate and um, interesting. So that's the mustard family. And we're just gonna keep going here. So the next family I wanna talk about is the rosaceae or the rose family. So uh, type genus Rosa, we have a lot of um, native roses here in our area. You can see that Rosa Nakana here, um, kind of a classic wild rose picture. Uh, again, it's a dicot. So five petals on that rose, you can see. Flowers are usually perfect. So they have male and female uh, parts to the flower. One exception would be the um, oso berry, if you're familiar with that plant, um, has separate male and female flowers. Um, and then when we're talking about the flowering parts, um, this would be five maris is one way to say it. So um, five sepals, five petals, five to many stamens. Um, in, in botany, we can only count to 10. So um, if there are more than 10 stamens, we just say many. Um, so you can see there are many stamens on this rose. Uh, radial symmetry, um, leaves simple to compound, usually alternate, again, that's not terribly diagnostic. Um, but the flowers have a hypanthium, and so we're gonna look at an image of what that means. And then uh, stipules are typically present, so we'll look at what that is as well. Okay, so this is a cross section of a rose family plant, and this is gonna show you what a hypanthium is. So this is basically a flowering structure that is present in this family. Um, essentially, it's fusing together the sepal, the petal, and the stamens. And that fusion is creating this like bowl or cup. Um, so if you were to go ahead and try and tease out a, stain, uh, a sepal from a flower, you're going to actually end up with a, a petal and a stamen attached to it as well. So they've been fused together. And then you can see the hypanthium is that, that little cup or that saucer um, that surrounds the pistil. So this is very characteristic of this family. And, you know, there's a lot of roses that we can go out and, and look at and kind of get a feel for what that looks like. Um, you know, uh, cherries and apples and um, things like that, you know, we can find quite commonly just to um, get a sense for what these rose family um, flowers look like. Okay, and then uh, stipules. So stipules are, now we're in the, the leaf, so we're leaving the flower and now we're moving down to the leaf. And um, so we think about the way that a leaf is attached to a stem, um, where that, that base of the leaf attaches to the stem, that's called the petiole or the stalk of the leaf. Um, 
you you sometimes find these um, leaf-like appendages. They're just, you can see from the image there, uh, the one on the left shows it quite clearly, it's labeled. Um, those leaf-like appendages are called stipules. So they're not true leaves, but um, they can help in identification and they might show up in a key if you're working with one. Um, so you'd have to trace that that leaf back to the stem and then find um, find those stipules there. So that's another uh, key characteristic that we can hone in on here with the the rose family. And then a little collage of um, some of our native species. So uh, this is a very large family. We have a lot of representatives here in the Northwest. So this is a great one to get to know. Um, I've got Rubus spectabilis here, or the salmonberry. We have a lot of different Rubus species. This is, of course, the um, garden, raspberry, blackberry, things like that um, are all Rubus as well. But we have some native raspberries, native blackberries. Um, and then below that, we've got the Oso berry. Like I said, this is the one that has um, separate male and female flowers. That's pretty cool. Uh, in the middle, we've got goatsbeard, kind of a big, lush, kind of um, in-your-face kind of plant that you might find out in the woods. Um, and then some of our smaller rep smaller representatives, uh, GM macrophyllum, large-leaved avens, um, kind of has a more um, lobed leaf, little... Um, shallow leaflets there. And then below that, we've got a potentilla. This is potentilla anserina silverweed um, with those, um, what we call pinnately compound leaves. So you can see how they've been divided up with that uh, leaf showing different leaflets attached to the, um, the stalk of the leaf. So just a, a very small uh, amount of the, the broader diversity that you might find in the Rose family here in our region. Okay, so the next family that we're gonna talk about is the Fabaceae or the pea family. Another great family, if you're a gardener, you're pretty familiar with garden peas or beans, things like that. Um, this is another one that has an old family name that you might see in the literature, the leguminosae. So this was named for the characteristic fruits of this family, which are the um, legumes. And um, it was renamed, obviously. The type genus is Faba, which apparently is now included in Vicia. So I put a picture of a, a Vicia there to kind of get a feel for uh, what the flowers of this family um, look like. So this is our first family that has bilateral symmetry flowers. Another word that is used for that is zygomorphic, um, which is. Um, uh, separate from radial symmetry, which they call actinomorphic. So just more words. There's a lot of words in botany. So um, if you might see that word is thrown around as well. Um, so anyways, these, these flowers have a distinct um, bilateral symmetry. And they also have the uh, what, what we can recognize as the banner wings and keel. And I've got a slide that'll show more of what that is. Um, but this is distinct for this family. So this is one thing that we're gonna, we're gonna look for if we think we have a pea family plant is to um, recognize that flower structure. Uh, this family also contains um, an, a very fascinating and useful uh, symbiotic relationship with bacteria that actually fix nitrogen, um, atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. So a lot of our um, agricultural cover crops are gonna be in this family like um, alfalfa, um, clover, things like that. So they're um, putting that nitrogen back into the soil after it's been depleted, which is often a limiting nutrient in the agricultural world. Um, leaves, generally alternate. Um, they can be pinnately or palmately compound. Um, sometimes simple, and then they often have tendrils, just like our, our garden peas. So we can find tendrils in our native species as well sometimes. Okay, so this slide will show us 
what I meant by the banner wings and keel. Another word, another word for that is papillionaceous, which is a really fun word to say, papillionaceous. So um, essentially what that means, we've got two images to work with here. The one on the left is a cross section of a flower. And then the one on the right is all of the flowering parts teased apart and labeled. So you can imagine this pea flower and it's got this petal at the very top and we call that the banner. So it's the large kind of, hello, here I am petal. Um, and then below that we've got two wings. And then below that we have two petals that are fused together and kind of folded up and we call that the keel. Um, and so that's really the diagnostic characteristic for this family is having those papillionaceous flowers. Um, so hopefully these images make that clear for you to see how that all fits together. And then um, something else that's really interested. So within that keel, that little folded up fused um, petals at the base, um, that's where the, the stamens and the pistil will rest. And if you pull that apart very carefully, you will notice that the stamens have been fused together, but one stamen, um, so uh, nine of the stamens have been fused together and then one stamen sticks out has not been fused together. So um, that's another thing that you can find as you're starting to dissect these flowers and kind of look at them more intimately. Um, so that is our papillionaceous fabaceae flower. And um, yeah, just keep kind of looking at these flowers and you'll kind of get more of a search image in your mind of, of what that looks like and, and it'll get more clear as you work more with it. Um, like I said, the legume or the fruit in this family is quite characteristic. So again, it's like your garden pea or your bean or legumes. And um, I put this image up here because it shows a legume next to a silic, which we covered in the uh, Brassicaceae, the mustard family. Just in case there, you know, is confusion, kind of they they kind of look similar, um, but you'll notice that the um, the seeds of the legume are attached to the fruit wall, whereas on the uh, silic on the mustard the fruit wall separates and the seeds are attached in the middle by that membrane. So um, that might be something that you could confuse um, a legume with. Um, so hopefully that helps clarify that if that was confusing for you. And then a little of the native plant diversity we can find here in our region. Um, starting on the left, we've got a lupin. We have a lot of the different species of lupins in our area, but um, they're easy to recognize to the genus level because they have those distinct palmate leaves. We don't really talk about what that means, but it's essentially, you could think of like your hand. So all of those leaflets are coming down um, and intersecting in the middle there. So we call that a palmate leaf. Um, Hosakia crassifolia used to be lotus crassifolia. So we've got lotus. Um, it's a vetch, uh, deer vetch. And then below that, we've got our clovers, our three leaf clover, a lot of different clovers in our area as well. Um, and then we've got Latheris japonicus, which is a, a coastal species you can find at the beach. And um, not quite sure if you can see the leaves terribly well in here, but they, they have the pinnate leaf compound leaves. So, um, one leaf is it includes all these leaflets that um, arise out of that from that central stalk. So it looks like paired um, leaves, but they're actually leaflets technically. So that's um, what we call a pinnately compound leaf. And then I had to put in an astragalus because they have the most amazing fruits. Um, common name for these is local weed. And <clears throat> they're um, typically more common on the east side of the Cascades, like in the desert region, and they just have the most interesting fruits. So that's actually a legume fruit that you'll see down there. And um, if you're around the east side and, and you see something crazy like that, like an inflated fruit, it might be a um, astragalus. So uh, that's just some of what we can expect to see here in the Northwest. And I'm gonna take a drink of water. Okay. 
So our next family is the APACE or the carrot family. Another one with an old name. Um, so the old name for this family is the Umbelliferae and it was named for this inflorescence type. So an inflorescence is how flowers are arranged together and that this um, inflorescence type is really uh, characteristic of this family. Uh, infl inflorescence type is called an umbel. You can think about it like an umbrella. Their names are similar. And we'll get a slide that shows that a little more clearer. Um, type genus is apium. That apium graviolens is a, a wild celery. Um, <clears throat> and flowers, uh, description is kind of generic. Five sepals, five petals, five stamens. Um, also radially symmetrical, so it's not terribly helpful. A lot of flowers have that um, uh, description. <clears throat> Leaves alternate, um, often pinnately or palmately compounds. So we saw some examples of that with the Fabaceae as well. And then, um, they, but they do have a sheathing base and this is quite characteristic of this family. So that's one thing that we can hone in on for this family. And I've got a slide that shows what that means. Um, so that's something that's pretty uh, good search image that you can use for this family. Uh, the fruit is a schizocarp, uh, which is a, um, uh, it's a fruit type that is ribbed. Sometimes it has winged edges, so it can be um, wind dispersed. And um, I don't have a slide for that, but that's one thing that you might wanna just Google for yourself if you're interested. Um, Okay, so in this family, uh, the inflorescence type, like I said, so the um, flowering structures, so not the individual flowers, the whole conglomerate of flowers within one plant, that's called the inflorescence. Um, in this family, they are an umbel. So um, essentially, like I said, you can think of it like an umbrella. So looking at that picture on the left, you can see that the, the stalks of those flowering heads all come down to a single point and then they radiate up and like the spokes of an umbrella and then typically have more of a um, flat top or a little bit rounded or concave depending. Um, so these umbels can be simple or more typically um, compound. So if it was simple you would have a single stalk with a single flower and that's it. If it's compound, you'll have a single stalk coming up and then that further branches into more stalks and individual flowers on those stalks and that forms the overall umbrella shape. Typically, like I said, we find more compound umbels present, like that picture on the left is a compound umbel. You can see the, the individual stalk rising up and then it comes to a point and then there's more stalks from there and then multiple flowers. Um, so the flowers are very small. And then, yeah, the sheathing base. So now we're looking at a leaf and you can see that um, kind of has this sheath at the bottom of the, um, the leaf stalk or the petiole um, that kind of wraps around the stem. So a lot of the um, plants in this family, you'll find that, uh, that feature. That's one thing we can look at. Um, of course, that one on the right there with the purple spots, the conium maculatum or the um, water hemlock, poisonous plant. Um, there, I will say there are um, some deadly poisonous plants in this family. Uh, obviously there's some edibles like carrots and celery, but um, we do have um, water hemlock and um, poison hemlock in our region. And so um, definitely, one of the families we wanna watch out for, for um, poisonous species. Um, so here's a few of the um, plants that we might find in our area. The uh, cow parsnip or Heraculum maximum used to be called Heraculum linatum. And um, this has a interesting um, reaction to some people. Some people are affected by the um, the outer uh, 
leaves and stem. And it's actually a, like a photosynthetic reaction. So if they uh, rub up against this plant on a sunny day and it has that UV reaction, they uh, might break out in a rash. Um, so that's one thing to look out for for this, uh, that plant as well. It doesn't affect everyone. Um, but some people are more susceptible. Uh, and then in the middle, we've got uh, Lomatium, Lomatium dissectum. We have a lot of different species of Lomatium in our area. Now you can see that beautiful umbel there, um, and then some uh, highly dissected leaves that go with that. And below that, we've got um, Osmoriza burderoi, uh, used to be Osmoriza chiloensis, I believe, uh, sweet Sicily. So this has more of like an anise flavor and smell to it. Obviously, anise and uh, fennel, dill in this family as well. Um, and then Dacus corota, not native, but definitely naturalized and super common. Uh, you can see along roadsides, uh, Queen Anne's lace or our wild carrot. <clears throat> okay, our next family is the Ericaceae. So this is the heath or heather family. The type genus is Erica. We don't have Erica in our region from what I know. So um, I could be wrong on that, but I don't believe that we have that genus in our area. Um, so this one, I can't remember. I think it's from England or something like that. Um, the flowers, five sepals, five petals, five to 10 stamens. We've seen that pattern quite a lot, so that's not terribly helpful. Um, but the flowers are often urn-shaped um, so that the, the petals are fused into this uh, distinct like bell shape. And that is actually very helpful for us when we're um, getting to know this family to recognize that pattern. Not all the flowers are like this, and we'll show a slide of um, some of the diversity in the flowers here. Um, often these plants are associated with acidic soil. Um, so like your blueberries like to have an acidic soil as well. Blueberries are in this family. Um, and a lot of these plants will find in peat bogs. So um, the sphagnum moss that kind of creates that nutrient poor um, uh, environment, that's where you'll kind of find some of these um, ericaceous plants. Um, and then leaves are often evergreen. So um, they don't lose their leaves in the winter. They persist throughout the season so that oftentimes when we have evergreen leaves, they're gonna be thicker, kind of have a waxy, coating to kind of protect them through the harsher, harsher months. So like I said, in this family, you can see the urn shaped um, flower on the, um, on the right, the um, native salal, if you've ever seen that uh, flowering plant, um, you can see those classic urn shaped flowers, but um, not all flowers in this family uh, look like that. So our rhododendrons, for instance, are not um, displaying that urn-shaped characteristic, but, and they're also not um, radially symmetrical. So those urn-shaped flowers are gonna be radially symmetrical, whereas the rhododendron actually, if you look closely, has a distinct um, bilateral symmetry or two different sides. And then here's a, just a classic picture of a peat bog. Um, so uh, these plants, you know, really have learned to thrive in these nutrient poor, poor soils. Uh, they prefer these acidic environments, things like that. So um, some of our uh, really interesting uh, ericaceous plants um, we can find in these bogs as well as wild blueberries, if you're into that. Um, and then like I said, many of the species do have these um, kind of tough leathery um, leaves that allow them to persist throughout the season or be perennial. So here's some of the diversity that you might find in our region. Um, small handful of some of the species that we have here as representatives for the Ericaceae. And um, starting at the top, uh, on the left, we've got the Arbutus menziesii or the Pacific Madrone. And um, yeah, a classic tree uh, species, <laughs> beautiful, that red sheathing bark um, has those urn-shaped flowers if you ever um, take a look at that. 
Um, below that, we've got Arctostaphylus uberursi or bearberry. We've got a lot of different species of Arctostaphylus here as well. Um, common name also for the other species are manzanita or um, down in California, uh, often called chaparral. Um, in the middle, we've got two of, uh, I didn't mention this before, we've got um, some plants in this family actually are saprophytes, so they don't produce their own chlorophyll or food, they steal food from other um, organisms. And um, two of the representatives I've got here, the pine drops or Trospera andromedia. This is more common on the east side, growing under pine trees. Um, and the ghost pipe or the monotropa uniflora, more common here on the west side, um, like in our more dense conifer forests. And uh, there's, there's more, um, species that have this uh, feature. So they're really cool to find when you're out there. And um, yeah, I encourage you to, to get familiar with some of the saprophytic, saprophytic ericaceae plants. Um, and then on the top left, we've got one, one of our many vacciniums. So uh, vaccinium is also the genus for the domestic blueberry. Um, and then the genus for um, the wild huckleberry or the uh, wild blueberry as well. So this red huckleberry is pretty common, uh, West Cascade um, species. Um, and then below that, we've got bog laurel. So these are, this is a representative of one of the um, little herbaceous plants that we might find um, in those peat bogs, kind of in the higher elevation Cascade region. Um, this one is uh, poisonous, I believe. And so, uh, we just want to be aware of that, but um, yeah, just a little bit of the representatives from from our area. Okay, so the next family we're going to dive into is the Lamy ACE or the mint family. Again, this is a um, pretty common family if you're a gardener. You might be familiar with um, these flowers and what they look like. Uh, again, this was this is a family that had an old name. So the old name of this family is Labiate. And um, basically that was representing the, uh, what's called the bilabiate flower structure. So labia, lips, you could think of two lips. So um, we'll get an image of what that, what that means a little bit more after this, but um, that is characteristic of this family. And um, yeah, the type genus is now Lamium. So you'll see that picture on the slide of Lamium purpureum or the um, dead nettle, um, quite common, not, not native, but definitely naturalized, very common uh, species you can find, uh, especially right now. Um, yeah, this is another one that's gonna be bilateral symmetry. So two uh, distinct sides. Um, and then five fused sepals. So those sepals are actually fused together. You can't pull one apart and just have a single sepal. If you're gonna pull it apart, you're gonna have to rip it from the other sepals. Um, five petals, like I said, fused into those two lips um, into like this tube-like structure. And we'll get an image of that here on our next slide. And then the stamens can be either two or four. Um, Another, I think this is our first family that has opposite leaves. So, you know, alternate leaves is more typical, more common. But uh, so when we find something with opposite leaves, it's um, helpful. Uh, so uh, opposite leaves in this family, meaning that when we look at a leaf and we trace it back to the stem, there'll be another leaf at the same point. So we have two leaves arising from the stem at the same place. We call that opposite leaf pattern. If there are more than two, we call that a world leaf pattern. If there's only one, we call that alternate. And then often this family is associated with um, volatile oils that give them their distinct scents. So, um, you know, rosemary, lavender, sage, kind of the culinary herbs um, are all in this family that we can think of as those really strongly scented plants. Um, but not, not all the mints have a scent. So this image will show you what I'm talking about when I say bilabiate flowers. So these two upper and lower lips. Um, 
That picture on the right kind of shows the image from below and then an image from the side. So, um, and they're both labeled to show you the different lips. Um, so you can see how that is um, formed with the upper and lower lips. So those petals are actually fused together to form those two distinct lips. And this is um, diagnostic for this family. So um, if we can recognize that pattern, then um, we can recognize this family, especially if um, we see those opposite leaves um, as well. Okay, and like I said, opposite leaves, two leaves arising from one node, essentially that means where the um, leaf traces back and attaches to the stem. And the stems are square. So this is another key characteristic for this family. So if you're to roll the stem in your fingers, you can feel like four different ridges. Um, if you were to take a cross section of the stem and look at it, you could see a square. Um, so that's another thing that we can hone in on in this family as well. And then, like I said, they have volatile oils that give them often have strong scents, but they don't always. Um, for instance, Prunella vulgaris, uh, not a native species, but um, quite common uh, in our area, the self healer, heal all it's been called. But then we do have a lot of um, wild mints as well, like this Mentha Arbenz that has a very strong uh, smell, the river mint. And here's a few of our representatives for this region. Um, Stachys mexicana, hedge nettle, very distinct smell. If you um, recognize this plant and start to get a search image for it and, and really a smell image for it, it's one of those plants that like, has just its very own smell. It's not quite pleasant, but not quite unpleasant, I will say. Um, and then in the middle, we've got Scutellaria laterifolia, um, skullcap, we've got different species of skullcaps. Um, so you can see that top lip kind of has a little hood on it, on the skullcap, and that's where it gets its name, skullcap. Um, Monodella bee balm, um, I think more of a east side plant. You can see that um, those opposite leaves there on that picture. Uh, Clanopodium douglasii used to be uh, Satareja douglasii or the Yerba Buena. This is a really, really nicely smelling plant. Um, trailing kind of creeping herbaceous plant in the west side forest. Um, often you think, oh, that's a weird looking um, twin, twin flower and um, the Linnea and um, come to investigate and it's Yerba Buena. So at least I do. Um, and then horse mint, Agastache, uh, more of a east side plant as well. A lot of different species of Agastache out there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the Asteraceae. This is, um, it's an easy family to recognize to fam or yeah, it's easy one to recognize to family. Uh, it's a massive family. It's one of the largest families in the world. Um, so it's very difficult to get much further than that. So there's actually, um, before you get to genus, there's actually tribes. So another layer um, of, of classification in this family. It's um, quite interesting family. Um, so, you know, the sunflower family essentially and used to have an old name. Old name was Compositae. And this was named for the inflorescence type. So um, looking at that picture of Aster, um, we, we call that a composite head. Um, that's the inflorescence type. So when we look at one of these um, plants and we see that flower, what we think of as a flower, we're actually looking at a conglomerate of multiple flowers. And um, we'll look more at, at what that looks like a little more closely in the next slides. Um, so flowers have five fused petals, five stamens, uh, type genus is aster. We have a lot of species of aster in our region. Um, like I said, one of the largest families in the world. Um, and then there is some unique vocabulary once you start working in this family. So they have uh, changed the word sepal to pappus because the sepals are modified to these little bristly hairs that help with wind dispersal. 
So these um, seeds are dispersed by the wind. And then the involucral bract is another word that gets used quite often in this family. Another word for that word is fillories. So you can't have enough words. Um, so both of those are used interchangeably. And essentially those are little bracts that um, sit below the flowering head or the composite head. So like I said, uh, a flowering head, like if you think of a daisy or um, a sunflower or a dandelion, um, that head of the flower is actually composed of multiple individual, very tiny flowers. <laughs> um, so in that picture on the left, you can see there are two distinct types of flowers. We have ray flowers and disc flowers. And then, and I've got a slide for that that shows that a little more clear too. Um, and then uh, in that middle photo, you can see the um, involucral bracts. So those green, they almost seem like they would be sepals, but they don't um, sit below a flower. They sit below an entire flowering head or, or inflorescence. So they're not technically sepals. They are um, these bracts. And then uh, that picture on the, the right, you can see the um, essentially a cross section of that flowering head and in the middle, the disc flowers, and then on the outside, the ray flowers. Of course, they're calling it fillories on that picture and involute bracts on the other. So both names used interchangeably. So like I said, um, there are two types of flowers in that head. And some plants in this family will have all ray flowers all disc flowers or they'll have both. So what's a ray flower? Um, the image on the, on the left shows what a ray flower is. So it's basically um, bilaterally symmetrical. So it's got that strap shaped petal and um, you can see those bristle like sepals that have been, um, that are referred to as the pappus and uh, two stigmas in this family. You can see quite clearly on these pictures, the two stigmas. Um, and then on the, the right side, you can see the disc flower. So um, these are radially symmetrical. So you can see the, the corolla or the petals um, labeled there with the five petals um, and how that is radially symmetrical, as well as the pappus and the um, two stigmas as well. And like I said, some uh, asteraceae flowers are going to have all ray flowers. For instance, a dandelion um, or chicory. Um, and then some, some flowers are going to have all disc flowers like tansy, if you've seen that plant. Um, and then some like kind of more the classic asteraceae, like a daisy or a sunflower are going to have all disc flowers in the middle. And then those ray flowers are going to be on the outer edge, kind of with the bigger petals leaning back, like um, more showy at, on, the, on the outer edge of that flowering composite head. So hopefully that made sense to you. And like I said, this is a very complex family, um, pretty easy to recognize once you get a search image for it to the family, but um, from there it can be quite complex. Really you wanna have a good, um, honestly a microscope, but um, hand lens as well. So here's some of our representatives in our region. Um, we've got yarrow, Achillea millifolium, um, has both ray and disc flowers. You can see those ray flowers with the big white petals on the outer edge and then those little disc flowers in the middle. Um, below that, we've got goldenrod, solidago, got different species of solidago in our area. Um, a lot of these flowers are gonna be blooming later in the season. So like August is a good time to find the Aster ACE. Um, of course, dandelion is one of our first flowers. so exception to every thing. <laughs> um, in the top middle, we've got Arnica. We've got some different species of Arnica in this area. What's great about Arnica is um, if you have Asteraceae flower and it has opposite leaves, there's a high chance it's gonna be an Arnica, which is a really nice, clear, distinct thing to hone in on. Um, Areophyllum linatum or Oregon sunshine. This is a common plant, um, both on the west side and the east side of the Cascades. Uh, Agoceros, we have different species of Agoceros, which are essentially our native looking dandelions. 
um, and below that Artemisia tridentata or big sagebrush, uh, kind of a ubiquitous plant on the east side of the Cascades and into the Great Basin uh, Desert and kind of the sagebrush step. So essentially defines a whole ecosystem and, and those have just the, the disc flowers. So no ray flowers on those. Okay, so we've got two more families to cover. These are going to be monocots. So all of our families that we've covered so far are have been dicots, and now we're going to get into a couple of monocots just because they're really beautiful. Um, so the lily ace is our first monocot family. And to review what a monocot is, um, remember we're going to look for that parallel leaf venation and then flowering parts in multiples of three. Type genus for this family is lilium. Lilium washingtonium is a gorgeous native flower that we can find here on the west side of the Cascades that smells amazing. Um, and, you know, this family is, has a lot of beautiful showy flowers that, you know, we've cultivated for ornamentals and things like that. So um, in this family, they have essentially um, done away with sepals and petals a lot of the time. Um, and just call them tepals because they're not really differentiated between the those two whorls and they look the same. So um, so that looks like it has six petals, but um, essentially it's three sepals and three petals that we call tepals. Um, not always the case in uh, Trillium, that's not true, although Trillium got moved out of this family. Um, so this family's had a lot of restructuring in the last few years. Um, based on um, genetic testing and things like that, further understanding of the relationships in this family. You can think about that family tree that we started out with and trying to kind of fill those gaps and figure out who's related to who. And it turns out this family was um, not as clear as others. So it's been kind of teased apart into um, Asparagaceae and the um, Menianthaceae are common ones. Um, and then bulbs are common in this family as well. Um, so obviously if you've planted lily bulbs, you know what that's about. Some have rhizomes as well, or tubers or corms, which are basically um, underground modified stem. Um, and yeah, the family's been through a lot of changes. So here we have kind of uh, the cross section of a generic lily family flower. <laughs> and um, one thing to notice in this family, so you've got your three parts, you've got your six tepals, uh, your six stamens, and you know, you think you're in the lily family. The next thing you might want to look at is where the ovary sits. We haven't really talked about this, but um, essentially if the ovary, it sits above the other flowering parts. So above the, um, where the stamens um, attach in the petals or tepals in this case, um, then that's going to be a what's called a superior ovary. If, for instance, that ovary is going to sit below those um, other flowering parts, then we call that an inferior ovary. And um, some some of our irises can um, maybe be confused with this family. And that's one way that we can distinguish between a lily and an iris is to look at that ovary and notice if it is superior or inferior. And then, like I said, a lot of bulbs um, and underground storage structures in this family. So we've got the camas bulb here, uh, camas being a real common um, wildflower in the Willamette Valley. Um, edible bulbs, um, staple food for the indigenous people. Actually not part of this family anymore, but I still put that picture in here. Um, and then the chocolate lily bulbs are those bulblets, uh, also called rice root. So that's an edible one as well, um, that have these little um, bulblets essentially. So you could grow um, a whole plant from one of those bulblets. Uh, but I don't recommend digging those up because they're, um, over, over picked, over harvested, and not as common as they might be. So some of our diversity, like I said, this is a real showy, beautiful um, family here. Um, so we've got our fawn lily, our erythronium, organum, has that kind of 
a bell shaped flower that that sticks down. We've got twisted stock, um, which you can see the stock kind of has a zigzag pattern. We've got a calicortis, a lot of different species of calicortis in the area. This is an east side calicortis, um, the mariposa lily. Um, we've got our chocolate lily and our tiger lily. So really beautiful showy uh, lily family plants. And then our last family that we're gonna quickly go over is the um, orchid family, excuse me, the orchidaceae. Um, this is a very large family, not that well represented in our region. Um, we do have some pretty cool orchids, um, but not like, you know, the, the tropics is really the epicenter of this family. And so um, uh, that's where it gets most of its numbers and diversity. Um, so the, the genus Orcus is the type genus, um, but is not represented in this family. Um, like I said, one of the largest families in the world. Um, again, here we are in the monocot realm of things. So uh, three sepals, three petals. One of them is typically modified into a lip and we'll see an image of what that looks like. And then for this monocot family plant, the flowers are bilaterally symmetrical. So the two face, um, two sides of a face. Um, and then, yeah, often fragrant and showy. In our region, they're not as like bold and beautiful as, you know, say in the tropics. So, um, so yeah, orchid flowers, zygomorphic, another word for bilaterally symmetrical. Um, obviously, if you've ever seen the orchids in the grocery store or something like that, you can um, get a general sense of what these flowers look like because a lot of our native orchids are quite small. Um, so that lower petal is often um, modified to a lip and sometimes even a pouch. Um, there's a lot of really cool pollinator relationships with this family um, in the tropics and things. So they've just evolved together to form really um, intricate relationships. And um, these flowering structures can be quite amazing. Um, and then the, uh, the stamen and the stigma are actually fused in this family to form uh, what they're calling a column. So that's another feature that we can find in this family as well. And some of the diversity that we have here in the Northwest, um, the fairy slipper, Calypso bubulsa, really beautiful little wildflower that grows here um, on the West side. Um, Corolla Riza maculata, this is a coral root, this is a, um, non-photosynthetic plant, so um, gets its nutrients from a host plant. And we've got our lady slipper, super beautiful. That's what that um, lip has been modified into a pouch. Um, Neotia cordata used to be called Listera cordata, the tway blade, you can see those two little um, leaves, paired leaves there um, that go with this uh, flower. And rattlesnake plantain, common uh, west side floor, forest plant. Um, where the, the leaves kind of look like a rattlesnake skin. Um, and yeah, a lot of these uh, flowers have real nice smells too, even though they're small, uh, you might wanna get down on your knees and give them a whiff. So um, yeah, before we uh, leave the lilies and the orchids, I'll just say, please do not pick the lilies or the orchids. They are um, often the ones that people pick. And so they get picked over um, too much and especially like our calypsos and things like that, they're quite sensitive. Um, so just uh, leave those where they lie and um, refrain from picking them. And I should say, you know, any plant that you're not familiar with um, that you go to pick, um, just make sure that, um, you know, you're really tuned into the ecosystem. Is it kind of a more rare uh, place? Um, does it, how many representatives are present in that area? Um, so, you know, as we're learning more about plants, getting more um, uh, familiar with uh, what, what the standards are, uh, it's kind of a great area. So, um, you know, definitely going out with other people um, with the Native Plant Society, especially um, is a great way to start and um, get to know the plants and, and see like, oh that plant you definitely don't want to pick for instance whereas something like a, a mustard or uh cardiomony that uh, is everywhere 
you know, that would be okay for you to dissect and start to get to know the intimate parts of the flower. So um, just a little caveat there. And a uh, few resources if you want to keep going with this, and hopefully you do. Um, a few websites, Oregon Flora Project obviously is a great resource. Um, our year next NPSO hike. So these are um, really the best way that you can start to learn the plant families is to just go out with people on these hikes and um, get to know the families that way because you have somebody there to kind of guide you along. Um, and then I found this website quite helpful that had a lot of those cross-section pictures. Um, if you want to see more images um, from, from different families, the Illinois, um, I think it was the University of Illinois or something like that. Um, they've got basically their, their family lectures um, digitized and accessible to anyone. So that was a, a great resource for seeing some of those images. Uh, some books that you might want to get, Botany in a Day, this is a great um, beginner resource for um, getting to know the plant families and some of the common patterns. Plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast is kind of the uh, best overall field guide you're going to find for our region. Um, if you're new to the area, this is where you probably want to start out. Um, for the Pacific Northwest, this is the classic flora. So if you really want to get into a technical key, um, this is this is where you're going to go. And then the floor of Oregon, this is a newer publication that um, focuses just on the um, plants found in Oregon. So no, that was a lot.